So I get to share this morning on Ruth chapter 3. Super excited to share what God showed me as I've been studying this. Just a few things to note. In our homework, we went through Ruth 4.12. If I were to teach on Ruth all the way through Ruth 4.12, we would, we would be here for a really long time. So I talked with Emily Richter. You're not going to want to miss next week. Emily Richter is going to be here. And I was like, Emily, do you want to do all of chapter 4? And she said, yes, I would. So she's going to do all of chapter 4. She's going to cap us off on Kinsman Redeemer. It's going to be an awesome time. But I'm just going to do chapter 3. And I actually, I printed this out for you. This is chapter 3. So if you don't have your print Bibles with you, if you want to just look at this while I'm going through it, because I'm really going to just go line by line through the chapter 3 of Ruth. So most of you know I have three boys. They're ages 6, 9, and 11. You know my life is crazy. I've shared that with you a few times. And I have a very picky eater. Uh, do any of you, maybe when your kids were younger, they were picky, or you were the picky eater, or you can just relate to having a picky eater? Anyone else? Like, I'm not the only one. Hallelujah, I am not the only one. I remember when my child was three years old, this particular child, and he refused to eat his dinner casserole. And so I said, okay, you're going to bed hungry, and you know you don't get, don't get any dinner. So he goes to bed hungry, he wakes up in the morning, I put the dinner casserole in the microwave, and I hand it to him for breakfast, and I say, here's your breakfast. He refuses to eat it. And I was like, all right, see how this goes. No food for you. So it's lunchtime. Warm up the dinner casserole. Here's your lunch. I have a picture of him literally turning around. Like, I will not eat that. He is a stubborn boy. He didn't eat anything for 24 hours. I'd like to say that it's gotten better, maybe a little bit, but it's, it's really not much better. We're constantly saying to him, I literally said to him two days ago, man shall not live on bread alone. Like, you cannot just eat bread. This is getting ridiculous. But I'm hopeful. I, I believe, because I've seen my oldest kid, and the kid eats a lot, and he's not picky. And I am believing, and I am having faith, that as I am intentional to continue to say, you will go to bed hungry, you will not get a snack, that as I continue to do that and be intentional, I am having faith that one day, he will wake up and decide food is good. Like, I can eat some other thing, more things than bread. Like, I just believe that that day is coming. And today, we are talking about faith. We're going to talk about faith, and we are going to see that faith requires us to be intentional. Just as I have to be intentional with my child and not letting him eat the food, we have to be intentional as we step out in faith. But we are going to see that as we step out in faith, our Redeemer responds. Our Redeemer responds. And I think that word faith, it has become a little confusing in some Christian circles. Um, like, I had somebody say to me a couple months ago, like, oh, that's cool, you believe in some higher power. Like, I think that's great that some people have that. And, you know, it's just like this unseen thing that we believe in. Or faith is something that we muster up on our own. If I just say the right things or don't say the wrong things, then certain things won't happen to me. Uh, I've heard of people who they, they won't say they have been diagnosed with cancer because that's a lack of faith. They won't say that they have pain because that's a lack of faith. Now, what we say does matter. We shouldn't be like speaking awful things over ourselves, but I don't think it's a lack of faith to say, wow, I've, I've been diagnosed with this. I believe that God is going to be with me through it. Um, if we have faith, bad things won't happen. That's another misconception. I know somebody whose son died of leukemia, and people in the church told her if he had just had more faith, if you had just had more faith, that wouldn't have happened. That is a misconception of faith. Or maybe like if, if you do anything, like faith is passive. I've heard of people who, if they have infertility issues, if they go to the doctor, well, you lacked faith. Well, you lacked faith because you went to the doctor. Like, oh, that is just so sad. These are all examples of ways faith has been misunderstood and they have hurt the message of the gospel. But today, we're going to look at the chapter 3 of Ruth, and we are going to see what faith looks like according to this chapter. And what we're going to see is that Ruth and Naomi, they had to be intentional with their faith, they had to be vulnerable with their faith, and that their faith was grounded in the covenant promises of God. And then we're going to see, as Boaz, our Redeemer, that our Redeemer responds when we step out in faith. So let's just recap real quick. Chapter 2, 
Ruthie did a beautiful message on the providence of God last week, and we also see in chapter 2 the character of Boaz, and Boaz represents our Redeemer. Remember that. Boaz represents our Redeemer. He is a picture of Christ, our Redeemer. And so we saw the character of the Redeemer in chapter 2. We saw that he protected Ruth, that he noticed her even though she was a foreigner. We see that he invited her to the table to eat with him, that he provided for her. And he represents our Redeemer, our Redeemer who cares for us, who notices us, who protects us, who invites us into relationship with him. But then in chapter 3, the focus is not on the Redeemer anymore. The focus is on those who need redemption. It's on the needy, Ruth and Naomi, who are in need of a Redeemer. So we need to remember, Ruth and Naomi, they're in extreme poverty. They're in extreme poverty. Ruth has gleaned during the barley harvest to ensure that they would have something to eat, but that, that is not enough. That will not provide enough for Ruth and Naomi. They need to come under the protection of a man. This is a different culture, different society. They needed the provision and protection of a man. The widow and the orphan were the most vulnerable. So imagine yourself in this situation. You have no food, you have no protection, no way to provide, no provision. Barley harvest is over, there's no more gleaning in the fields. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? So Naomi has a plan. We're gonna look at Ruth 3, one through five. So one day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet. He will tell you what to do. And look how Ruth responds. I will do whatever you say. I will do whatever you say. Okay, this plan's a little wild. Anyone else think this is, this is a little crazy? Let's go sneak into the threshing floor. Let's lay down at his feet. Like, what is going on here? As a little girl, I was just like, I don't, I don't really know what this means. I don't really know what this means. As I got older, I just thought, well, Naomi is telling Ruth to seduce Boaz. That, that's what I believe. Ruth, she's just trying to seduce him. Um, why is she telling him to lay at his feet? What in the world? What is going on here? I just thought this just it seems sexual, honestly. It, and that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right. But I have learned... This is not an attempt to seduce Boaz. It is not an attempt to seduce him. Naomi and Ruth are putting their trust in the character of the Redeemer. They're putting their trust in the character of the Redeemer. We, we know it. We just talked about his character. He's humble. He's a provider. He's caring. He is trustworthy. That is why it is so important that we know who our Redeemer is. We know who our Redeemer is. We need to know who he is. That's why every time we say when you're reading the word of God, so often what we want to do is say like, okay, what am I supposed to do? And how does this apply to me? And all those are good things to do. But what we first have to do is say, God, what does this say about who you are? We want to know the character of the Redeemer so that we can put our trust in the Redeemer because it's going to be impossible to follow a God that we don't trust. So we need to know the character of the Redeemer. Ruth and Naomi knew the character of the Redeemer. And because they knew the character of the Redeemer, they could be intentional and reach out to him. So from Ruth 1, 1 through 5, we first see that faith is intentional. Faith is intentional. Faith is always something that you live it's not just something you believe. It is something that you live, and often it radically rearranges your life. Radically rearranges your life. Naomi is putting a plan into place to provide a permanent home for Ruth. She's not just sitting around waiting for something to happen. She's putting her faith in the covenant promises of God, trusting that Boaz will redeem the family. So true faith reaches out to God. True faith 
trust us that God is faithful and that God will do as he promised. So what does it look like for our faith to be intentional? I'd love for you to talk about that in your small groups. What does it look like for our faith to be intentional? I think it, it can be a little tricky because what we can quickly do is kind of rely on our own abilities and force things to happen and be like, well, I'm just being intentional with my faith. And, and then you're like, are, are you sure you're being intentional with your faith? Like, I'm not, I'm not quite sure here. Um, so how do we decipher? We've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. We've got to go with the peace that he gives us. And our first step of intention is prayer. Prayer. We have to go to him in prayer. Prayer is being intentional. Prayer is not passive. And prayer will lead to action. I just read this quote. It says, no matter what the current state of your prayer life, there is the possibility of limitless development. We have the possibility of limitless development in our prayer life. And I can just say right now, I believe God is calling every single one of us to grow in prayer. I think he's always calling us to be more dependent on him, to grow more in prayer. He's really been impressing that on my heart lately. Just pray more because then I'm going to grow in a trust of him. Martin Luther said, this is so funny to me. He says, I am so busy that unless I pray more hours every day, I will not get my work done. I am so busy that unless I pray more, I will not get my work done. That is a man that was dependent on God. I'm like, I'm so busy, I don't have time to pray. And he's saying, no, 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 I am so busy that I need to pray. We need to be women of prayer. That is making our faith intentional. So today I want to challenge you, embrace prayer, choose to trust God, be led by his spirit, go where he leads you. So as we keep reading, we see it says she went down to the threshing floor. She did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly. She uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman <laughs> lying at his feet. Ah, what is going on? All right, let's put ourselves in Ruth's shoes here. She's a foreigner. She has to stay hidden. How do you think she was feeling as she's watching Boaz? In the homework they talked about, do you think her heart was pounding? Do you think her heart was pounding like, oh, oh my goodness. Do, do you think she wanted to maybe just, this is a crazy plan. I'm, we're calling this quits. This is craziness. She's alone. She is going after dark to a threshing floor full of, listen, off-duty and relaxed men off-duty and relaxed men, men who had most likely had a drink or two. And remember, it's the time of the judges. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. It is the time of the judges. In most places, in the time of the judges, what Ruth did would be to lay herself open to the possibility of drunken abuse. That's the situation she's putting herself in. In doing what Naomi says, Ruth is abandoning any safety, any security, and she is entrusting herself to the Redeemer. She is entrusting herself to the Redeemer. She depends entirely on the noble character and the trustworthiness of her Redeemer because she believes he will treat her right, because she knows her, his character, and because she has no other hope. So we see from this that faith is vulnerable. So faith is intentional, and faith is vulnerable. It's vulnerable. Faith means abandoning what we know. It means abandoning our security, our comfort. It means putting ourselves in very uncomfortable positions, situations that make our hearts pound. <laughs> Faith means coming to Christ and abandoning all other security. And Ruth was able to do this because she knew the character of the Redeemer. So what will it look like for us? What will it mean for us to just cast ourselves entirely on the mercy of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and abandon every other source that we have of security? Just can we abandon those other sources of security? Just... Think of your life. Does your heart pound as you step out in faith? Have you had to abandon all other securities and step out? 
Let's, let's challenge ourselves this week. Like, let, let's do something. Let's try to do something that we're like, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm a little nervous about this. Like, what if it's, I mean, this makes my heart pound. Praying with someone in the grocery store, seeing a random person and God puts them on my heart and walking up to them and saying, hi, God just put you on my heart. Would you mind if I prayed for you? Like, that, <laughs> that freaks me out, right? That freaks me out. But think of like, if God really put them on your heart and maybe they're going through something, like how God could use you, that is stepping out in faith. Maybe it's sharing the gospel with a coworker or praying with a coworker. Maybe it's sharing your testimony with a family member. Like these things are vulnerable, but because of who God is, we can step out in faith. We can step out in faith. Maybe God wants us to abandon. We, some of us, we have so much financial security, and it's good. We should, be, we should be wise and smart with our money, but maybe God is calling us to give more to missions, to give more. C.S. Lewis wrote, If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. Man, that's convicting, isn't it? That's convicting. But maybe God is saying, just abandon it all for the sake of the kingdom. Step out in faith. Maybe he wants you to get a little more uncomfortable. How about this one? Maybe he wants you to speak in your small group. Right? (laughs) How about volunteering? I'm just going to help out our team here. Volunteering in the parking lot. They really need volunteers in the parking lot. So, (laughs) you know, that that would be super uncomfortable, right? But something, something that's putting yourself out there, something that kind of just freaks you out because faith is vulnerable. Faith is vulnerable. And God, he knows what's in you. He put it in you. He knows what you are capable of because he put it within you and you are capable of greatness, greatness. God is calling you to the thing that scares you because it's going to make you dependent on him. And like I said, it is already in you. He put it in you. We just get to step into it, baby steps. We just step into that thing that he has called us into. And I'm not saying it's like some big thing, go start a ministry. No, be faithful, do the small things well, and then God will lead you and show you. But faith is vulnerable. Let's do some things that get us a little uncomfortable. And what's really cool is you do it, And then that one thing that's uncomfortable gets a little bit easier. And then God calls you into a new thing that's more uncomfortable because he's always calling us to more. He's always growing us. He's always stretching us. So Ruth, she is vulnerable. And she literally, literally cast her life at the feet of the character and the trustworthiness of her redeemer. So Boaz, there's this woman lying at his feet, Ruth 3.9, he says, who are you? He asked. She says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Spread the corner of your garment over me. So did you notice when Naomi talked to Ruth, she said, wait for Boaz to tell you what to do. Does Ruth wait? No, she doesn't wait. She tells Boaz what to do. She tells Boaz what to do. And when she says, spread the corner of your garment over me, she is saying, marry me. Marry me. And she is not dressed seductively. She is dressed as a bride would dress. She is reaching out in faith. She is asking Boaz to marry her and to raise up through her an heir to continue the line of Elimelech on behalf of Naomi. One commentator said, This plea is the most direct and daring expression of faith in the whole book. Ruth is calling in the covenant promises and asking Boaz to honor them, not just by generous gleanings, but by marriage. And she's appealing to Boaz based on the grounds of covenant obligation. So we've seen faith is intentional and it's vulnerable. And here we see faith is grounded in covenant promises. Faith is grounded in covenant promises. Ruth is appealing to Boaz based on the fact that he is the kinsman redeemer. She's not going to him and 
basing it on some possible romance. We don't know if there was a romance between them. The book does not say. She's not basing it on like, oh, I'm beautiful. The book doesn't say that she was beautiful. She is basing her faith on the covenant promises of God. See, faith, it's not something that we do or don't have. Faith is a conscious decision to trust God for what he has promised, trusting God for what he has promised. It is claiming the promises that are made to us by God in Christ, claiming those promises. And I struggle a little bit with that word claim because I think of the name it, claim it, where if I just say I'm going to be healthy and wealthy and you know, never get sick, then every, that, that's going to happen to me. And I, no, that, that's, that, is not, that is not true. That is not part of the gospel. It's a, it's a false message. But we are called to claim the promises of God. We are called to claim the promises of God. So what are we basing our faith on? Are we basing it on our ability to get it done, our strength, our knowledge, our giftings? Or are we, like Ruth, abandoning it all and putting our faith in the promises of God? What are some promises that we can claim? Here's just a few. He will never leave us or forsake us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He will fill us with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When everything seems hopeless, we can say, God, I can't muster up any hope right now, but you will give me hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Other covenant promises that we are crucified with Christ. That that old person who wants to sin, who struggles with comparison, who struggles with jealousy, who struggles with pornography, who struggles with selfishness, that person is dead. That person is dead. And as I walk after the Spirit, the behaviors of that person, those behaviors that I hate within me, those behaviors are going to die too as I am led by the Holy Spirit. That's a covenant promise of God that we can claim When we fall short, as we will, and the enemy accuses us over and over again, we don't have to listen to his accusations. We can say, I've been completely justified. I've been completely justified just as if I'd never sinned. My Savior paid for those sins, and I am righteous before a holy God. He sees me as pure and holy. We can put our faith in the fact that he said, I will finish the good work that I started in you. God's not finished with us. When the suffering of this world seems too much to bear, when we are hurting, when we don't see any change, when loved ones die much too soon, we can put our faith in the God who sees us, who comforts us, who gives us hope, who gives us peace amidst the trials. And we can put our faith in the covenant promise, God, that he is coming back. He is coming back, and he is making all things right, and all we will ever know is pure joy forever and ever and ever. We can put our faith in that. We need to claim those promises, live from these promises, because they are ours in Christ Jesus. The victory is ours in Christ Jesus. And Ruth understood the covenant promises, and she is operating in faith and asking Boaz to honor that role. So how does he respond? Gotta love Boaz. Ruth 3.10. The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier because you have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. So that word kindness, that's that word hesed in Hebrew. I talked about that a few weeks ago, meaning steadfast covenant love loyalty, going beyond what is expected. And Ruth is showing this hesed love to Naomi. The kindness here that he's referring to is her kindness to Naomi by being willing to raise up an heir for Elimelech. I saw one commentator said that if there is a love story in the book of Ruth, it's not between Boaz and Ruth, it's between Ruth and Naomi. Ruth's love for Naomi, how she lays down her life over and over again for Naomi. First, she abandoned what she knew in Moab, abandoned her safety and security there to go with her. And now she's not running after younger men. She's saying, I will marry Boaz so that I can raise up an heir for you, for Naomi, to redeem Naomi. Verse 11 says, and now my daughter, don't be afraid. She probably needed to hear that in that moment after everything. Don't be afraid. 
I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. I don't have time to get into it, but that's the Proverbs 31 woman. I think they went over that in our homework. Ruth is a Proverbs 31 woman. But he says, I will do for you all that you ask. So from this we see faith is effective. As we step out in faith, our Redeemer responds. Faith is effective. Boaz says, I will do for you all that you ask. And that's the same thing if you look at verse 5, where Ruth says, I will do whatever you say. So Ruth exercised faith as she said to Naomi, I will do whatever you say. And now the Redeemer is responding by saying, I will do for you all that you ask. So faith is a gift from God. God gives us the ability to have faith, but it's something we embrace. It's something we step out in. So as we're intentional, as we're vulnerable, as we put our faith in the covenant promises of God, faith is effective. Our Redeemer responds. And it's not always the way that we think it should be. We know that. Right? It's, it's definitely not always the way that we think it should be. This world is full of brokenness and hurting and pain, but God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher, and we can put our faith and our hope and our trust in the Redeemer. We can trust that he says, I will work all things out for the good of those who love me. We can trust that. So in verse 12, Boaz continues, he says, Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. No, no, there can't be another, right? Don't you feel that? There's not another. No, 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 no. So he says, stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet, but got up before anyone could be recognized and said, no one, or... And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. Then he also, we see this, bring me the shawl you are wearing, hold it out. And he gives her six measures of barley, place the bundle on her. So yes, we're sad to hear that there's another redeemer. Do you think Naomi knew that there was another redeemer? We don't, we don't know. But what this tells us is that Boaz is a man of the law. He says there's another redeemer. We have to give him an opportunity to redeem it. And we also see from verse 14, again, the character of the Redeemer. He protects her. He doesn't want her walking home at night because, goodness, it's the time of the judges. What could happen to her if she walked home at night? And he's also protecting her reputation. And then he provides for her. He doesn't want her to go back to Naomi empty-handed. So he gives her, I think somebody said it's like 15 gallons of milk. Can you imagine, like, walking with that? She was a strong woman. Ruthie pointed that out last week. She was a strong woman. (laughs) So verse 16, when Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, wait until you find out what happens. Why? Because the man, he will not rest. He will not rest (laughs) until the matter is settled today. She says, wait. So from this, we see that faith is steadfast in waiting. Faith is steadfast in waiting. We could probably do a whole 10-week Bible study on this truth alone, that faith involves waiting. It is steadfast in waiting. All throughout Scripture, we see people waiting David had to wait for 20 years before he came king. Thankfully, Naomi and Ruth only had to wait less than a day at this point. But faith always involves waiting. And what we see at this chapter, what began with the hope of a home, (laughs) ends with a redeemer not resting. Boaz says, or she says, the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So it ends with a redeemer not resting until he has delivered on the promise that he is committed to. Isn't that awesome? He is not resting until he has delivered on the promise that he is committed to. And yes, our Redeemer, the work of the cross is finished, but our Redeemer is still working. He is ever interceding for us. He is our prophet, priest, and king. He is running after us. 
He sent his spirit to comfort us, transform us, strengthen us. He will not stop working until the work is done. We are waiting for the day until our Redeemer comes. And until that day, we know we're, we're going to experience some hard times and some rough days and some sadness. But we get to reach out to our Redeemer in these moments. We get to reach out to him, trusting that he will respond. So I was thinking about this, this fact that faith is intentional and faith is vulnerable and faith is grounded in covenant promises and faith always involves waiting. And God reminded me of my own personal life about five to seven years ago. I was struggling, and many of you who have been in here, I've shared with you. I struggled with comparison. I struggled with jealousy. I struggled with insecurity. I felt like I was not enough. Um, I hated myself. I struggled with condemnation, the accusations of the enemy. Just he accused me over and over again, and I just felt like I fell short in every single area of my life. It really culminated with me just like sobbing on my floor saying, I hate myself. I hate myself. I just, I struggled in such a mighty way. And I knew the truth because I grew up in the church. I knew the truth, but I had to step out in faith. Faith is intentional. I had to step out and say, okay, I had to figure out why am I feeling this way? What are the lies that I'm believing that, that are causing this? How do I learn to identify with the truth that God has met all of my needs, that all of my needs are met in Christ? Like, I know this truth, but how do I identify with this truth? How do I identify with all of these things? You know, we get all these, like, I am chosen, I am blessed, I am, you know, this, there's so many in scriptures, but I didn't actually believe them because I struggled so much. So I had to learn how to identify with the fact that I was united with Christ, that I'm a new creation in Christ. And I had to get vulnerable. I had to confess to people. I'd say, I struggle with comparison. I struggle with jealousy. I struggle with pride. And I hate this about myself, and I don't want to be this way, but I don't know how I don't know how to get better because it just seems like I'm trying to white knuckle discipline this and not be, you know, I say, don't compare, don't be jealous, don't do this, don't do that. And and it never got better. It just didn't feel like it was ever getting better. But as I got vulnerable and then as I grounded, as I grounded my faith in the covenant promises of God, as I learned to renew my mind by being intentional and grounding myself in the covenant promises of God and just saying over and over again, I am a new creation in Christ, that girl who struggles with comparison, that girl who struggles with jealousy and pride and insecurity, that's not who I am. I'm a new creation in Christ. I've been justified before holy God. He sees me as pure, righteous. The lies of the enemy, they are false. And I just renewed my mind again and again, being intentional. And then I did a whole lot of waiting. I did a whole lot of waiting because faith involves waiting. But I was steadfast in waiting, and I began to finally believe there's going to be a day that I'm not going to struggle. Because I used to just think that's just part of the Christian life. Like, I'm just going to struggle with this. That's what I thought. Like, just accept it. You're going to struggle with it. That's who you are. But all of a sudden, there was this day. And it was like I'd just been doing it for a while. And all of a sudden, I realized, wow. Wow. I don't struggle like I used to. Like, I don't have all these lies coming at me all the time, and I'm not feeling so insecure, and I, I'm not struggling with comparison, and I'm not struggling with jealousy, and like, wait, like, what? And all of a sudden I realized it's because I was intentional. I got vulnerable. I got counseling. I grounded my faith in the covenant promises of God. I reached out to my Redeemer, and I kept waiting, and I just kept doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I found that faith is effective. Faith is effective. Our Redeemer responds as we reach out to him. That's what he does. So today, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Is it healing? Maybe it's physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing. Perhaps you're waiting to be delivered from a struggle with sin like I was, like comparison, jealousy, pride, addiction, laziness. Maybe you're waiting for a loved one to come back to the Lord. Whatever you are waiting for, you can know that your covenant redeemer, as you reach out to him, he will respond, and he has not stopped working. 
He has not stopped working. And there's a day coming that he's going to eliminate all sin, pain, hurt, suffering. Revelation 21, 3 through 4. I think this has probably become one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. (laughs) He will dwell with him. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. Why? Because the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We are waiting for that day. He's coming back. He's establishing his kingdom. He's going to make all things right. But until that day, until that day, Let's reach out to our Redeemer. Let's be intentional to reach out to our Redeemer. Let's be vulnerable. Let's step out in faith. Let's ground our faith in the covenant promises of God. Let's wait, continue to wait for him to work. Trust that he will work. And then let's watch as he responds. And let's rejoice and be thankful for the day that he does respond.